Raphion's heart ached with grief and flamed with fury. Splutches of deep crimson soaked into the golden sand as those who bled slipped into timelessness. Everything was timeless here in the caverns. And it was what the cavern sheltered that the fallen dragons of Azeroth had died to defend. Raphion, Earthwarder, aspects of the Black Dragonflight, turned sand to glass with the magma he breathed. His loyal flight, a dancing wave of gleaming ebony scales followed him, weaving between the swirling pillars of sand to fight back against the tide of infinite darkness. All were as free as he was from the madness that had cursed the first aspect of Earth. Nelfarian, otherwise known as Deathwing, was gone forever. He lived solely as a distant memory, his only ability to harm in the recollection of his wicked deeds. Raphion led the Black Dragon flight now, battling to protect Azeroth alongside the four other flights, blue, green, red and bronze. They were united in purpose at long last, and then it came, as it always did, the shadow falling upon them, upon him. No, I must not look up. But no sooner did he think it, than he began to twist and shriek. Metal plating spread over him, containing him as he contorted into a form less of solid flesh than of liquid fire. When the horrifying transformation was complete, the monster he had become, fueled by hatred and rage, opened his massive iron jaws. There is no Raphion, the thing of metal and magma cried. The voice was dreadful, heart-stopping, and familiar. There is only I, Deathwing, now and always, Raphion found himself hissing. But it was not his mouth. He watched helpless as the aspects swooped to attack him, as the black dragons doubled back to blast him, their old enemy made anew. All they saw was Deathwing. All Raphion saw were the blazing streams of dragon fire hurling toward him. All he heard was his own voice bellowing, You are my legacy. You shall never escape my shadow. Fire filling his vision. The heat. The brightness. I'll never be you. Raphion bolted upright, his throat raw from the shout. It took him a long moment to realize he was not in the timeways, under attack by his own kind. He was safe in a comfortable bed at the Summer's Rest Inn in Pandaria. He reorientated himself, taking slow, deep breaths and focused on his surroundings. He noted the maps affixed to the walls, the chairs draped with crusty, mud-stained garb. The lacquer table, obscured by empty bottles and sheaves of notes from his travels. Among the detritude sat a scroll, neatly rolled and stamped with not one, but two wax seals. There was a soft knock on the door. Refion quickly composed himself, shrugging into an embroidered robe, then running his fingers through his thick shock of black hair. No doubt the Pandaren at the door had heard his nightmare spurred shout, but he would be damned if he ever admitted to it. Come in. His voice had his usual silky timber. Mephon entered, bearing a tray heaped with local delicacies. They both pretended nothing, nothing at all had happened, as she cleared a place on the cluttered table and set down the laden tray. The raw terror of the dream still lingered, but Raphion's stomach growled as he surveyed the rice cakes, tea and buns. Food was good, grounding even. May I bring you anything else? Raphion forced a smile. No, that will be all, he said, and then added, Actually, Mephon, might you bring by my lunch later? I think I shall stay in and be a lazy layabout for the change. He pretended not to notice Mephon's eyes darting to all the empty wine bottles. I'm honored to serve such an esteemed guest, if you wish to anything else. Yeah, yeah, ring the bell. I know, thank you. He waved his hand in a shooing gesture, and Mavon, not intimidated in the least, bowed and closed the door behind her. Refion let out a sigh, and then selected a rice cake, pointedly ignoring the scroll's silent condemnation. As he ate, the remaining shreds of the recurring dream dispersed, but questions remained. Could he avoid following in Deathwing's dark footsteps, 
shake the shadow? Or was it possible that Refion would one day succumb to that shadow? A dull ache in his chest pulled him from his uneasy thoughts. It was constant, this melancholy that had been plaguing him late. For years, Refion had been researching the mysterious place known as Dragon House. It was no legend, though it very well might have been. The famous wandering owl Pandaria had nothing on these owls when it came to elusiveness. Refion had sought intel to no avail. The things he had done, the places he had gone, the deals he had made. So much effort for so few answers. Most of the people he interrogated knew nothing. And many of those who did know something appeared to be disinclined to reveal more than a few bits and bobs of highly useless information. Vexing, really. Speaking of vexing, his gaze fell upon the scroll once more. It sat there, taunting him. With a growl, he snatched it up and unfurled it. First, Arcanist Felistra and Regent Lord Lorthmar Faron request the pleasure of your company as they join hearts, hands and souls at the Lunastra estate. Formal attire requested. Refion scoffed. <laughs> the pleasure of your company. Ha! This wedding was a monumental event in Azeroth history. The joining of two powerful leaders. And so, of course, they placed it in the game so we could all experience it and help out with the questline and perhaps even prepare the wedding and make a nice little RP area we could have our own weddings. <gasps> and yet he knew that even if I did only as a courtesy, no one in Azeroth really wanted a black dragon, especially him, at any sort of grand occasion. It was good political theater to trot out some, uh, trot out someone so instrumental in defeating the old god Nazoth and saving the world. But neither the couple nor their high-profile guests would deem being in his company a pleasure. Refion crumpled the scroll with unnecessary vigor and flung it into a corner. Weddings were notoriously sappy affairs, and this one was likely, uh, likely to be especially so. According to the reports of his Black Talon operatives, it was a true love match, one that had blazed to a flame during a poetry competition. Poetry competition of all things. There would be other giggling happy pairs, families with their giddy children, old friends reuniting, positively stomach churning. Refion arrived at the Lunastra estate with the wedding ceremony in full swing. He had hoped his attendance would provide him a reprieve from both his nagging nightmare thoughts and his fruitless search for the Dragon Isles, and also offered a chance for him to be seen. After all, he deserved to be here, showing face amongst the who's who of Azeroth, especially who was going to become aspect of the Black Flight one day. Presently, all eyes were on the wedding party. With his keen dragon eyes, Refion could see the lingering magic of the dome that once encased Suramar, its faint curve and the bell ravaged area that had stalwartly held at bay were testimony to all the Nightborn had endured. Refion turned his attention to Lady Liadrin, the fire-haired leader of the Blood Knights, who was officiating for Felistra and Lorfmar. The lovebirds standing before her were, Refion had to admit, gorgeous. Lorfmar was almost unrecognizable, for Refion had never seen him wear anything other than armor and a stern expression. Knowing the history of his people, Refion could not blame him for either. Now, the leader of the Blood Elves was clad in colorful draped fabric and smiling gently, the warrior within yielding to the lover. While Lorfmar wore no giddy grin, still he was softer and seemed lit from within by a quiet joy. Felistra made no attempt to conceal her happiness, and her smile was full and free. Why wouldn't it be? Refion thought. The whole place was aglow with people from near and far. Standing with the bride were her advisors and former comrades in arms in the night fallen rebellion. Refion spotted Arcanist Valtois, Lyle of Lulastre, and Silgrin and his owl Call. Tron's closest friends, Ranger General Halderon Brightwing, beamed, while Grand Magister Romuff wore robes and a rare smile. Among the attendees, the variety was even more evident. Frau, former leader of the Horde and now member of the Horde Council, had brought his family, his wife, Agralan, and their two children, Durak and Reze. The youngsters were well behaved, Refion supposed, though he knew very little about children. Well, nothing at all, really, and he had no desire to start learning now. 
he took in Quinta Lungi, who had made the trek from Zandalar. Bring along Zakan, another younger guest. Rokan, leader of the Dark Spiritual, stood with them. There was High Chieftain Bane Bloodhoof, who, Refugee observed with a sly grin, came with Mela High Mountain. Lillian Voss had accompanied Kalia Menefil, erstwhile princess of Lordaeron and now part of the Forsaken Desolate Council. Beside her was her champion, Derek Proudmoore. In the past, Refion had sought to protect Azeroth by pitting Horde and Alliance against one another in order to determine which side was the mightier. Now he understood that the fate of the world it hung not on conquest, but on collaboration. Looking out over the captivated congregation, he was proud of the Horde, of Lorfmar and Felistra, who had invited the Alliance, and he had respected those of the Alliance who had accepted their invitation. From Lord Commander Trevelyan, Regent of Stormwind and Protector of the Alliance, his partner, Illyria, and their half-elf son, Arator, to Mephire Shaw, who was no doubt keeping an eye on the leader of the Alliance at a Horde wedding. Enduin, the King of Stormwind, who had been absent from that role for over the past few years, had always believed permanent peace was possible between the two factions. He had worked towards that goal with a quiet tenacity that Raphion had admired. After the Fourth War, Enduin's hope had become a cautious reality, whereas Refion's hope had been twisted and thrust at him in the form of the Dark Dream. Lorfmar's voice cut through Refion's brooding. He was reciting his vows in poem form. My beloved Felistra, the gift of sorrow is the blessing of joy. The gift of the burden is its release. The gift of the storm is the clear sky. From this moment... I pledge to be at your side through both sorrow and joy. I pledge to share your burdens. I pledge to weather the storms with you and embrace with a full heart the brightness of the stars. Raphion had not known a place so full of people could be so still. Felistra's tears slid like liquid crystals along the lavender of her cheeks as she spoke with a voice soft with emotion but clear her hands clasping her soon-to-be husband's hands. Lorfumar, my heart, the years are now echo with regrets I had not understood till this moment. I did not know how I longed till you were there to assuage my longing. My world is painted with bursting color, the palette of dreams once hidden now manifested. Let us craft with word and deed, with mind, body, and heart, this new existence where two are one, now and forever, and beyond forever, I shall love you. Raphion should not have been surprised that their vows were in verse. It had sealed their love and always be the language of their hearts. His own heart surged suddenly with that peculiar ache, and he rubbed his chest, hoping to massage it away. Before all gathered here, and before the holy light itself, Lady Aldrin said, I confirm with these words, Felistra and Lorfumar have entwined their lives, their fates, their hearts, she grins. May love and light ever shine upon you both. Then Lorfumar lifted his face, and Felistra lowered hers, and as their lips met, and their arms went around each other, cheers, applause, and Rakus whoops went up. Raphion had wished to congratulate the newlyweds and then take his leave, but they had not even finished descending the steps of the dais before guests cluttered around them. He rolled his eyes. I shall wander about until the happy couple is less besieged. Once more, his presence did not go without notice, as he maneuvered through the crowd with his chest puffed out and his chin held high, as was fitting for a future aspect. The glances of awe and admiration from onlookers pleased him, easing the ache in his chest and putting his old confidence back in his step. He had practically walked the span of Azeroth on a journey of self-discovery, studying the world, learning all he could about her people, fought besides the world's greatest heroes, even against his own kind, to protect Azeroth. Surely, he had done enough to prove that he was not anything like Deathwing. He surprised himself at the jollying sensation of being drawn into the atmosphere. By the time he reached the busy bar area, he was feeling more like himself. And there, not only could he enjoy a beverage, perhaps also overhear interesting tidbits. Something told him that this would be a fruitful endeavor. What was it the goblin said? Jackpots. 
as he awaited for the much-desired glass of Arkwine. He sidled up alongside Talia Four, Dragon of Cult Tirith. She was speaking with the former blue dragon aspect Caligos, who was in his visage of a half-elf, with a hand on his chest as if in a pledge. Raphion noted it looked a bit sad. The Lord Admiral is doing well, Talia told Caligos. Lady Jaina wanted so much to be here, but her hands are rather full. We're having some, um, trouble with pirates? Pirates again? Interrupt the Flynn Fairwind, Talia's friends. Nasty business. What flags are they flying, huh? Might be old mates of mine. If so, I'll tell you all their tricks. Kalik offered Flynn a polite chuckle. <laughs> He's not joking, asserted Mafia Shaw in a deadpan voice. Flynn smiled happily at him, and Shaw's lip twitched beneath his moustache. Was that a smile? Refion thought the old adage, opposites attract, was certainly true with this pair. Flynn was a reformed pirate, and Shaw led Stormwind's SI7, a covert intelligence agency. Yet here they were, a happy couple amongst other happy couples. Did no one else come alone? Refion, Calix said warmly. I'm glad you decided to attend. Not attending was never even a thought. Refion took his glass of arc wine and raised it celebratorily. It would be a shame to miss the chance to enjoy such fine arc wine. And fine company. Talia's eyes widened, and she took a step towards him. I'm honored to meet you. I hear the world owes you great thanks. Refion gave a benevolent nod. I serve Azov gladly, in any way I can. As do we all, he added graciously, gesturing to the sea of guests. Celia, Derek Proudmoore, approached with Kalia and Lillian and doffed his hat. It's so good to see you, though I do wish my dear sister had been able to attend. Raphion could not help his mouth from hanging just the slightest bit open in disbelief, as Talia welcomed all three warmly. Here was Jaina's brother, a forsaken, who was accepted by his family and former compatriots. Even so, he stayed close to Kalia. In theory... He has enemies on all sides, Refion mused. But he also has family, blood or founds, on all sides too. Refion realized perhaps he was a touch... jealous? Refion took note of who else was not in attendance. I could not help but notice that there are no night elves present, he shared airily. His talents had informed that at Tyrande and Malfurion, they were still smarting after what they viewed as mistreatment at the hands of the Alliance during the war. Refion had also learned that the Kaldori were preoccupied with a new development. He did not know the nature of the endeavor yet. Talia glanced around. I'm sure the Night Elves were invited. Oh, I'm sure. Refion took a slow sip of his arc wine. I do spy Queen Mia. Alright, so the Kaldori, that's the seed pit, by the way. They got a seed at the end of Shadowlands, which they're going to plant somewhere. Uh, presumably the Dragon House. Uh, but they're also smarting about... Not wanted to sign the treaty with the Hordes, even though the Alliance did show up to help them in the Shadowlands eventually. But apparently they're still smarting a little bit about it. Okay, yeah, fair enough. <clears throat> the Queen had come in her husband's stead. A wise decision, since King Gangreymane was said to have held on to his hatred of the Hordes. Furthermore, the petite convivial Mia warmed hearts with her mere presence, mixing kindness with a cheerful practic practicality. She was filling a plate with Surumerian delicacies at a nearby banquet table. The forsaken delegation exchanged uncomfortable glances. Ah oh yeah, because they kind of played Gilneas. It was a pleasure to see the queen again, Kalia said diplomatically. Raphion watched as Mia struck up a conversation with Illyria Windrunner. She whispered something to the ranger, and Illyria burst into laughter. Raphion raised an eyebrow. Illyria was always serious. Both she and Trellian, who was talking with Talungi in front of the towering Lavender Frosted Wedding Cake. Felistra had thoughtfully placed it on a small cart, which would be wheeled to various areas so everyone could see it in its unsliced magnificence. Raphael noted that Trellian seemed oddly relaxed in the heart of Horde territory. The Black Dragon averted his gaze, thinking their behavior spoke volumes about the changes the past five years had brought. And it dawned on him. His loyal spies who kept him up to date had informed him that it had long been tensions between the two. 
Refion supposed a thousand years of war could do that to a couple, but it appeared the light infused paladin and the void touched elf had rekindled what had been a legendary romance. Refion, Kaelic was regarding him curiously. Are you alright? Never better, Refion lied. He lifted his glass to the assemblage and gave a bow. You'll pardon me. I think I see Mechni glinting over there. I should say hello. He had indeed seen Mechni glinting. He glinted frequently, sometimes blindingly. <laughs> what a way to describe Mechni. <laughs> Fortunately, the soft twilight of Sudamar did not create too fierce a glitter. The <laughs> I'm just imagining Maggie walking around doing like sparkles, sunshine, yay! Sorry. <clears throat> the former dwarven king had once attempted a ritual right before Deathwing had erupted from the earth, wreaking destruction and death to speak with Azeroth itself. It had worked with Kvitz. Well, Magni was now the speaker of Azeroth, he'd been turned into a solid diamond. It doesn't seem to bother him or his family. Magni. His brothers and his daughter were roaring with laughter with the young troll Zakan, who looked at him in admiration. Refion spread out his arms as he strode towards them. Magni, he cried, genuinely glad to spot at him, for the two had worked together to defeat Nazoth. Oh, Refion, come here, laddie. Let me introduce you to me family. There's me brothers, Muradin and Bran, and there's me dear daughter, Moira. I of course know all your names, Refion said with a dashing wink. It was true, and what a pleasure to finally meet you, he added, taking in the lively bunch. Oh, we know about you too, Moira said. Me da here will not... Me da here will not shut up. Refion was caught off guard. Such a warm welcome almost undid him. The feeling was... contagious. Magni unwillingly came to the rescue. We Bronzebeard boys have just returned from exploring Northrend, and we should overhear us talk about young... And who should overhear us talking but young Zakan here? Zakan was almost incandescent with the light. I'm proud to meet you, Zakan, but, um... I think there may be another whom I've got yet to meet. Moira, did the future Emperor accompany you today? Aye! Do I... <laughs> Aye! Do a hit to pull his nose out of a book, she said. I'm glad I did. Look over there. <laughs> Stop laughing. Can't do it if you're laughing. <laughs> According to reports through his talents, Dagran II, the child of a Bronzebeard princess and a dark iron emperor, was heir presumptive to both thrones. His physical appearance embodied traits of both parents. Skin, a warm shade of grey with green eyes. Refion had been told that one could see the occasional glimmer of a fiery red in them. Dagran's long white hair was pulled back in a tidy braid, and his gawky frame was dressed in elegant formal garb, which he lightly ruined by sitting on the grass beneath a tree. Arator sat beside him, and they chatted amicably as Arator flipped through a large tome. Perhaps the one Moira had needed Dagran to put down, and the dwarven boy examined a beautiful ceremonial dagger that Arator had worn to the wedding. Oh, nice. Okay. So, uh, this is actually a, a very cool description of Dagran II for the first time. Like, we can see the baby modeling game, but this is a more mature description of them. And hopefully, this is also an indication of, okay, the five-year time skip. We're going to see more of Dagran in the story. Dagran is me heart made flesh again, Magni said softly. And Jan Arator's a good lad, a kind one. Growing up, Dagran didn't have many friends. Refion understood not having many friends, or any friends at all. He'd never truly been a child. He'd grown so swiftly and been driven by so dark a purpose that there'd been no time for play. Of course, a childhood disrupted by wars and conflicts didn't help, meaning Endo and Pandaria had been both a gift and a curse. A gift because Refion had learned that someone, anyone, might deem him worth caring for. A curse because Refion had chosen to exploit Anduin's trust in an ill-conceived attempt to protect Azeroth. They had met again years later, and that encounter had been... Well, suffice it to say, Anduin had a much better right cross than Refion had given him credit for. He hoped they could reconcile once Anduin returned from wherever he was. Refion drained his glance, 
and a strange ache in his chest returns. Yo. This is as close as we're gonna get to a confirmation between Raphael and Enduin, by the way. Just putting it out there. You are my legacy. You shall never escape my shadow. Would you like to meet him? Moira's question made the black dragon start. They seem content. I'll, uh, I think I'll stretch my legs a bit. What a pleasure meeting you. Over yonder was Serene Pond. He was not sure if it was the Arquine, the number of guests hemming in around him, or the ache. But he decided that he would walk for a bit, and then go. I should not have come. Let my spies gather what I need to, uh... To do what? He would never find the Dragon House. He would never be able to make and keep a true friend. Inspire troops, or taste the type of joy that Lorfmar and Felicia had found, or the Bronzebeards. Eyes fixed on the pond. He strode quickly toward it. Stopping with a growl when a warm, rumbling voice called out to him. Ah, Refion, there you are, for the Shadowlands! Refion closed his eyes, then turned with a forced smile. Bane, Mela! The traveling cake had reached this area, and as Servant passed by, Refion held himself to another glass of Arkwine. He could use it. I am surprised and pleased to see you chose to attend, Bane said. Yeah, well, the guest list called for Azrael's best and brightest, after all. They laughed. He drank. Mela slipped her arm into Bane's, and the High Chieftain covered it. Refion had to fight the impulse to dash his glass to the ground. How dare you be a love? He'd expected a wedding would be, well, you know, a wedding. But it was so much more, and everywhere this inescapable sense of belonging and love and connection like some sort of cheerful blight rises to engulf everyone and smother them with cozy contentment everyone of course except for him him and that tarn over there he was black furred with white markings on his muzzle he was not dressed formally as the invitation had requested but wore shamanic robes and held a staff and he was staring directly at them. Ah, your pardon, chieftain, Refion said to Bane, keeping his eyes on the stranger. But, um, is that solemn looking fellow a friend of yours? Bane followed his gaze and frowns. Kurog, one of Magatha's grim totems. He all but spat the words. Bane had every reason for his vehemence. Refion had learned through his spies that Magalfa Grimtotem had secretly poisoned a weapon that killed Bane's father, Karen, turning a scratch into a death sentence and instigating a coup. Thunderbluff soon returned to Bloodhoof hands, and Bane had shown mercy, merely exiled the Grimtotem, but clearly bad blood still lingered. Very bad blood, if the expression on the interloper's face was any indication, Kurak showed towards them. Felistra and Lorfmar have sullied themselves by inviting dragons, let alone a black dragon, the shaman said, the most unnatural of them all. Why a shaman would know so much about black dragons, Refion did not know. Hearing a maid, his hands holding the cup of Arquine tremble, but for an instance. Metal plating clamping down, forcing magma to retain a form. Refion took a stealing breath. Re-reining it in. He would play the part of a future aspect, not a monster. A smile alighted on his face, and he gave a courteous bow, taking note of the many heads started to turn their way. Was this where the show ended? You should not be here, Bane stated. I have the same right to be here as you, Kurok retorted. And Refion held his tongue. I'm a shaman, Kurok continued. We don't take kindly to black dragons around here. The entire earth is mine to walk. <laughs> oh, I doubt that very much. Refion's voice was smooth as glass. The Nightborn has suffered far too much to protect Sudamar to let Rip Rav like you saunter in. Where's your invitation, by the way? Refion was in his pouch, albeit wrinkled from his earlier ire. Who admitted you, huh? No matter. I will very gladly escort you out before anyone else takes notice of you making a silly fool of yourselves. Refion could hear the onlookers watching quietly. Let them watch. Kurok kept going, scrutinizing him. How are you, mate, Refion? 
Cobbled together out of pieces of corpses? You and your depraved cane? You're the very symbol of all that's gone wrong in this world. Almost onlookers murmured in shock at Kudok's words. Refion heard a voice from deep in the crowd, cheering his horn on. A chill ran through Refion, but not from the voice that descended in the crowd, rather from the peculiarity that a shaman would know this bit of awful specific information. He wondered if he was the reason that Tarn had decided to show up. Kurok gave a leering smile. It was ugly and cruel and filled with glee at Refion's discomfiture. You could save Azeroth a thousand times over and still never be a natural part of it. You're an outcast and you'll never remove the reek of who you are. A skeleton of iron and not of bones. The rage burning hotter than fire. And there was a snap. Pain blossomed in Refion's hand from the broken shards of the Arkine, Arkwine glass that he had crushed. He ignored it and lunged forward, seizing the shaman's robes and lifting the enormous horn as if he weighed nothing. I could incinerate you in half a heartbeat, Refion snarled, his voice harsh and deep and unfamiliar. He pressed on, shaking the shaman. With a single sweep of my claws, your lifeblood would flow into the... The sands of time, stained with the blood of so many. The blast of Mechma, my own dragonflight coming for me. And the shadow, always the shadow. Refion felt a hand on his arm, and Kalik was there. It took every bit of control Refion had not to turn on him too. Let him go. Now, the blue dragon said calmly. Refion took great heaving breaths before shoving Kurok away. The shaman staggered, crashing into the cart, supported a fount-inspired wedding cake. The cart tipped over before the appalled server could react, and the great, beautiful pillar of cake toppled to the paved stone. Not the wedding cake. Kurok righted himself with his staff and growled, looking ready to charge. Some onlookers shouted in concern for Refion, others in support of Kurok. Kalix sought to place a reassuring hand on Refion's shoulder, but this time the Black Dragon shrugged him off. Refion's red eyes narrowed to angry slits as he prepared to rush the torrent. Stop! Felistra's voice, usually warm and modulated, cracked like a whip. Whitch! Refion froze along with Kurok. What has happened here? The first arcanist was controlled despite her fury. Her hands were glowing with power so palpable that Refion could almost smell it. She surveyed the crowd and then her ruined wedding cake. Refion started to speak. This grim totem, Mela interrupted, her voice as steely as Felistra's, has trespassed onto your lands, intruded on your celebrations solely to harass your guests. Felistra turned to Kurog. Evaluating the brutes. I shall grant you more courtesy than you showed me, Tauren. Allow to leave on your own two feet. Go, before I change my mind. The palsy magic weaving her hands had not wavered for an instant. There were two types of aggressors Refion knew. Those who wilted like a flower before snowfall. And those who, despite all warnings, could not resist a last swipe. Kurok was clearly the latter. As he sped at Refion's feet, he gazed out at the crowd smugly. Soon you all know the true power of the Tauren. And then he bowed in mock courtesy at Felistra, eyed Bane and Mela with contempt, and turned to depart. Bane and the others looked just as puzzled by the Tauren's warning as Refion felt. Felistra nodded to Silgrin, who wordlessly moved to follow. The spell fencer would ensure that Kurok would not get lost on his way out. Refion registered that several of the bystanders, they were glaring at the shaman, offering Refion awkward smiles in support. Others smirked at him. Their faces showed poorly concealed loathing. His sharp ears caught the cruel, ugly words that they thought Refion could not hear. And another voice, this one in his head. You are my legacy. You shall never escape my shadow. Refion straightened, gazing from the cake to his hands. The rage had spent itself, and the other pain, somehow worse than anger, was making itself known again. Heat rose in Refion's face 
and he silently curses like a control. Composing himself, he spoke. I regret not expressing myself in a more civilized fashion. Doing what he could to recover the dignity that he had torn to shreds. Raphion forced himself to look at Felicia and Lorfmar. I'm sorry for causing such an incident. There's no need to apologize, Lorfmar said with a twinkle in his eye. The baker said many more cakes where that came from. We regret that our security was insufficient, Felistra added. None of our guests should have been exposed to such vitriol. You're very kind, but uh, I should have realized that my presence here would be uh, provocative to some. I hope this did not tarnish your memories of this most joyful occasion. I am... Um, I must depart now. I wish you both nothing but happiness for all your days. And they did not protest. I owe you my thanks, Bane chimed in. Kurok is a powerful shaman. He, uh... Refion held up a hand. Flashing, charming smile. No need for thanks. The black dragon bowed, straightened his shoulders, strode off without another word. Elvor, thank you very much for the 75, love. You are ready for secret sanas? Ooh. Refion did not know the identities of the towering twin statues in the vineyards. They were nightborn, holding aloft standards. The standard frames were toppled with a carved crescent moon that proved a comfortable surface, and that was all he needed to know. He lay cradled in one, his legs crossed at the ankles, and hands laced behind his head. He was deeply tired and a bit drunk. Between the dead-end search for the dragon isles and the harrowing dream that continually shattered his sleep, his endurance had all been drained. And that the haunting twinge in his chest, wearing him down in his waking hours, and one could start to see why he had taken to consuming so much wine of late. The disaster of the day had done nothing but reinforce every brooding thought he held about himself. So many in the crowd had moved so swiftly to derision. He was quick to anger, and he was not fit to lead. Not when he had threatened Kurok with such violence over nothing but words. Even now, Refion felt the shadow of death wing upon him. Foolish to have hoped for anything else. His dark reverie was broken by a voice calling his name. He ignored it. Refion, the voice called again. Sighing, the black dragon peered down. Like himself, the other dragon was still in his visage, which was as striking as his true form. Caligos, what do you wish of me? The blue dragon lifted a bottle of arc wine and two glasses. Some help in uh, drinking this fine vintage, even though, you know, you clearly have a drinking problem. Not such a bad idea. The wedding had been an escape from his mounting uneasiness. More arc wine would perhaps do the trick. Raphion leaped from his makeshift perch, shifting into his true shape and reassuming his visage after landing. My company will likely not be pleasant, Raphion said as he accepted a glass Calic offered, recalling the overly optimistic wording of the invitation. But you're welcome to it. Kalik looked at him with compassion as they wandered toward the bench and said, You are not at fault, Raphion. You were invited. The Grim Totem was not. He came only to cause trouble. And unfortunately, he succeeded. The Tauren are a great and kind people. He filled Raphion's glass. Most of them, at least. There are exceptions to everything, of course. Safe for black dragons, it would seem, Refion replied. Hatred of my flight seems fairly unanimous, don't you think? Even I felt it necessary to uh, thin their ranks. He followed the looks of some of the wedding's guests' faces before he left. The fear, the disgust, the voice of Deathwing in his mind. Kurok was not alone in his revulsion. You played a major role in the feeding us off. A major role in far less safety events. He took a sip. The wine was sweet and heady. I wish I hadn't come. I'm sure Lorfmar and Felistra would agree. Kalik mildly took a sip of his own arc wine. I, for one, think they made it clear they're furious that someone trespassed and insulted a few of their honored guests. A humorless smile quirked one corner of Refion's mouth. Perhaps. But if so, it's only because they and you are exceptionally kind and open-minded. The rest well, we black dragons are cautionary tales. Kaelic pressed his lips together and then sighed. It can be difficult for others to trust your flights, 
he said quietly. I know a bit about how that feels. I also know that we will likely never discover if Nelfarin embraced the madness of the old gods by choice. Raphael looked away. He did not want to show how deeply the words resonated. It's possible that he was a victim of their influence and did not wish for this fate, Kayla continued, adding after a moment, just as Malagos did not wish for the pain that twisted his own mind and spirit to cruelty. So this is connecting to the legacy episode where we saw Deathwing fall from grace, right? Refion rarely flinched. He did not do so now, but he felt the impulse. He'd been told that the original aspect of the blue dragonfly had once been a warm, humorous, and kind. Much he fought like Caligos. When nearly all his flight had been slaughtered, the blue aspect's mind had been lost to grief for eons. When he recovered, Malagos was so greatly changed that he attempted to exterminate any mortals who dared to use magic. In the end, his own kin had no choice but to attack and to slay him. As I said, you are kind. Kind enough to avoid mentioning that Nelfarian's betrayal of his dearest friends was the incident that shattered Malagos and cost your flight so dearly. I'm told they were indeed close, friends who shared many secrets. Now... Sadly, all lost the time. Kalik poured himself another glass of Arquine. His voice in the next moment was sure and strong. But you, Refion, are not Nelfarian. Interesting, it might be that only Melagos and Nelfarian knew about the Drakfir, as Melagos helped his friend lock them away. Interesting. If only I could honestly believe that. But had a Nelfarian become Deathwing, who would Refion become? He clinked his glass with Calix. Nor are you, Melagos. It was intended to be a compliment, but Refion saw Calix's shoulders slump. The blue dragon laughed sadly. Ah, oh, not much of anything anymore. There's barely a blue dragon flight at all now. We should not have this bandit. Not when our numbers were so small. Calix pressed a hand to his chest and let it fall as he looked out into the night. The Aspects had surrendered their height and granted powers to finally and utterly destroy Deathwing. They were still dragons, of course, but Aspect now in name alone. The Blues, Refion knew, had drifted to disconnected places all over the world. Well, Refion said lightly, trying to shift the mood, though perhaps the effect of the Argwine was bringing out his mattier side to him. Aren't we a fine pair? Two brilliant, handsome young dragons with no flights. I suggest that, since neither of us has any community at all to speak of, if our aspects could be friends, then surely we can as well. After all, as the mortals are so fond of pointing out, misery loves company. That got a genuine laugh out of Caligos. You help slay an old god. Perhaps others will stay well clear of us. But I am curious about something. The last time we spoke, you inquired about the Dragon Isles. I'm sorry that I could not be of more assistance. Knowledge of them is as cloaked in secrecy for me as it is for you. Have you discovered anything further? Nothing. Refion looked to the sky. You were the only one who told me anything of value. That the land's magic had gone dormant a long, long time ago. I wasn't even more then. I can't believe that little scrap of information was all you learned. Who else did you speak with? Refion counted on his fingers. I asked Chromie if she knew where it was, he said, referring to the bronze dragon. She said yes, and then no, and then admitted that she was confused. Ysera is gone. He sobered for a heartbeat, thinking of the absence of the green flight's aspect. And Nosdormu won't even grant me an audience. Nosdormu leader of the bronze flight, was preoccupied maintaining all the infinite timeways. And Alex Raza? Kalik asked, keeping his voice neutral as he brought up the aspect of the red flight. The reds and Refion had a rather complicated past, which included trying to kill one another on more than one occasion. He'd been so desperate for knowledge that he'd swallowed his pride and spoke with the Dragon Queen, who was unexpectedly kind. Even so, she had only sighed and said, It is a place that is lost to us. Nothing of consequence, was all Refion said. He sounded and felt despondent. He had for some time and found it increasingly hard to hide the pain from others. Attending the wedding had only deepened the feeling. He found his hand at his chest, pressing as if to physically soothe the ache. 
Glancing up, he saw that Kalik was doing the same thing. Kalik? Refion asked slowly. Are you in pain? Kalik a bit lost in thought and then started. Oh, oh no no no, well, he amended. Not, not so much pain as a sorrow. There have been various times in my life when I felt desolate, alone, that there was something I wanted, needed, but couldn't have. I am experiencing the same sensation, Refion said, red eyes narrowing, as if there's a weight on my chest, a feeling in my bones I, I can't seem to articulate. Yeah, that's it exactly, exclaimed Kalik, and also as if I'm piss so pissing, <laughs> as if I'm missing a piece of myself that I didn't know I had, but now I yearn for it. They looked at each other for a long moment. Refion spoke cautiously. If we are both feeling this sensation, then perhaps other dragons are too, Kalik breathed. For the first time in a long time, hope flickered within Refion, and he was overcome with a desire to meet a certain someone, as if summoned. I hate to humble myself yet again. I'm uncertain if I will find answers, but perhaps we should go to Wormrest and ask Alexstrasza some questions. Refion quirked an eyebrow. Let's stop finishing each other's sentences, shall we? Kalik laughed, then moved his hands elegantly, opening a portal. A glimpse at its center revealed a cool, teal and blue-white landscape. Perfect. I was growing frightfully wary of all this purple. And with that, Refion stepped through. It would seem that we are not alone in our mysterious malice, Refion remarked. That is an understatement, Kalik murmured. They had materialized near the base of Wormrest Temple, finding themselves in the center of the largest gathering of dragons Refion had ever seen. Some bore their visages, and did not escape Refion that many placed their hands on their chests, over their hearts from time to time, waiting for the Dragon Queen to address them. Refion did not expect to see any of his own flight there, of course. There were plenty of red and bronze dragons, and many greens as well, but he was sad to spot so few blue dragons in comparison. Kalik was right about them being scattered. There's barely a blue dragonfly at all now. Stay here waiting with the rest of them if you like, Refion told Kalik, but I refuse to squander a single moment more. The troubling sensation was not abating, but rather increasing. Suiting actions to words, Refion shifted and flew directly to the top of the temple. He was done with waiting. Waiting to find the Dragon Isles. Waiting for the dreams to stop tormenting him. Waiting to understand what this cursed feeling was and why he feared the unknown. And yet, as he recalled the joy that he'd witnessed at the wedding, the warmth of loved ones, the power of connection, of belonging, Refion was terrified that whatever Alex Straza had to say, it would not be good. And whatever his heart had been seeking would never be his, even if it had a name. Even if it had a name. Alex Straza was in her visage. Long red hair, almost the same hue as her cloak. Gazing at the mass of dragons gathered below her. With her was Nosdormu. He was often stoic and difficult for even Refion to read. Which was likely a good thing. Considering his powerful knowledge of past and future. But now he looked pensive. Distant even. Beside him stood Ysera's daughter Marifram who had stepped up as the informal head of the Green Dragon Flight after the loss of her mother. While Marifra had her hand to her heart, she did not look distressed. Her night elven face instead showed... peace? Alex Straza. This, this feeling, this... lost for words, Refion thumped his chest. Refion strong, what is happening to us? She turned and her face, as it had been during his last visit was soft and alight with joy. Straight to the point. You're ever true to form, Refion, she said with gentle mirth. Why, thank you. Alex Straza stepped forward, and, as if there was not, and never to be mistrust or resentment between them, gently placed a hand on his face. To his own surprise, he allowed it, comprehending that the significance of this moment transcended any quarrels. Young one, the Dragon Queen said, exchanging a sage look with Nosdormu. You have heard the call, and you have answered. Refion did not understand. The call? Yes, the call, she said, speaking to all of those standing closely around her. One, 
Long awaited. All of us here below, anywhere in the world, we've all been called and we've heard it with our hearts. The Dragon Isles are awaiting our return. But Raphion shook his head, still not comprehending. Raphion, she said softly, you are homesick. The ache, the desperate longing for something he'd never had. Homesick? The Dragon Isles had never been denied to him. They were only waiting. For him and for every other dragon in Azeroth, his people, Raphion, had not been excluded. He was being welcomed. He belonged. Now that he knew what the hurt in his chest represented, it dissipated, transforming into something close to exaltation. And as the Dragon Queen turned to continue in sharing the jubilant revelation with all those gathered below, Raphion, the Black Prince, the dragon without a flight, realized his recurring nightmare also had the power to transform. He saw it now, not as a forecast of an inevitable fall to darkness, but as a challenge to be accepted and conquered. All of dragonkind was in this moment, his kin. The dragons get up below, cheered and applauded at the news, as if on cue. Homesick, he mused himself. But he had a home now, and soon, soon he would have a flight. Raphion fought of the vows exchanged earlier, pledges of undying devotion and care, and he made one now. It would be he, not Deathwing, who would guide his flight to their future. And that was a promise he would keep. Yay! That was not so short story. <laughs> like medium long. Oh, yay! That was a good story, though. Um, still missing the little detail on um, why the Dragon Isles wake up now. Because there's some bit about the elements reawakening, and that's like what's caused the, uh, the Dragon Isles to wake up. But the details are still to be revealed, so I'm quite curious about that. But yeah, all the dragons here, the calling. The Dragon Isles have awakened. Tony Stony Baloney has activated the beacon. Let's go, right? Cool.